On behalf of children of Jewish Holocaust survivors, the Claremont Institute, and the Israeli Missile Defense Association, I welcome you here tonight and thank you for attending this very important and timely event. I also want to thank all the people who forwarded the invitation to their lists. I thank the Lux Hotel for their graciousness and generosity in providing this beautiful venue and the delicious kosher refreshments. I am Doris Wise Montrose, President of Children of Jewish Holocaust Survivors. This past week has offered us so much evidence as to why what will be discussed here tonight is so crucial. In defiance of UN resolutions, North Korea has fired a missile over Japan into the Pacific. The electricity grid in the US was penetrated by spies. And of course, Iran continues with their goal of achieving nuclear weapon capability. In this same week, the President of the United States announced to the world his commitment to the reduction of American nuclear weapons, and Gates has slashed the missile defense budget. Can anything be more upside down? History has taught us, and that is the mission of children of Jewish Holocaust survivors, that when despots so clearly make their intentions known, they mean what they say. Israel and the US each have common, each have enemies from within. We share the same enemy from without. We must understand that Israel is not the prime target for this enemy. The prime target is America and Western civilization. The continued exist existence of Israel as a Jewish state, secure with a strong military, is what is standing between the life we know and love and the end of civilization as we know it. While this may sound extreme, I ask you to remember the Holocaust. Tonight we have put together an expert panel to learn from and to discuss these very issues. Avi Schnur of the Israeli Missile Defense Association and MPACT, Brian Kennedy, President of the, of the Claremont Institute, and Larry Greenfield, Vice President of the Claremont Institute, who will be the moderator. Within the next couple of months, the organizations involved tonight will be hosting a follow-up event. Children of Jewish Holocaust survivors will be forwarding updates from the Israeli Missile Defense Association to the list. A question and answer period uh, will follow the presentation. If you would like to submit a question for our panelists, please raise your hand at any time. We'll bring you a three by five card and a pencil. When you're done, we'll come and pick it up. Again, I thank you for your participation. I now turn the program over to Larry Greenfield, who will introduce the panelists and begin the program. Hi everybody, good evening. Thank you very much, Doris. Thank you for all your leadership and bringing us together. Thank you all for being here tonight. Congratulations on not having to stay up and do your taxes uh, two days before uh, Pax Day. Double congratulations if any of you have capital gains in the year that you are uh, hopefully uh, going to approve. On the subject of good and evil, congratulations Los Angelinos on your 1-1 victory on opening day over the Giants. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Um, and again, thank you all for being here. Thank you for being interested in what I have called the next step, the next conversation in pro-Israel advocacy and activism. And I think if you are inspired and informed this evening, you will want to include others to oppress policymakers and the community generally on these subjects. If you'll indulge me, as a humble but proud Navy man, let me just say a word or two in tribute, since I think it's still on our minds just more than 24 hours later. Tribute to the Navy SEALs, the free captain. And also tribute to an American hero, Captain Richard Phillips, Richard Phillips. The birth of the United States Navy and our Marines began during our Revolutionary War and developed under the direction of our third president, President Jefferson, in response to Muslim Barbary piracy off the coasts of Tripoli 
in the Tripolitan Wars, aka the Barbary Wars, 1801 to 1805, just 200 years ago, to protect American interests and those of our allies, trade and use of the high seas, and project American power and secure freedom around the world, our U.S. Navy continues to promote our security with its force projection through our fleets and our sailors, including special warfare seals, as well as through our sea, land, and air capabilities, including the Aegis carriers, the cruisers, which carry our ballistic missile defense capability. The list of American Navy heroes joined by this week's seals includes John Paul Jones, who said, I just began to fight. Commodore Crow, the hero of the Barbary Wars, and Lieutenant Stephen Decatur, Commodore Perry, and Admiral Nimitz, and many others. The Navy motto is non sibi sed patria, not self, but country. The Navy's core values are honor, courage, commitment. I was involved in Navy Intel, we have a submodel. In God we trust, all others we monitor. <laughs> in the 20th century, both Teddy Roosevelt and FDR were assistant secretaries of the Navy. At one point, six straight modern American presidents were Navy men. JFK, LBJ, President Nixon, Carter, Ford, and George Herbert Walker Bush. And of course, an American hero, Senator McCain, got close. Tonight is not about partisan politics. <laughs> The mission of the U.S. Navy is to maintain, train, and equip combat-ready naval forces capable of winning wars, deterring aggression, and maintaining freedom of the seas. Our first president, George Washington, said without a decisive naval force, we can do nothing definitive. President Jefferson's quote is, we ought to be a naval power if we mean to carry on our commerce. President Wilson said, our ships are our natural goals. And an important leader, Admiral Trost, said, when a crisis confronts the nation, the first question asked by policymakers is, what naval forces are available and how fast can they be on station? Let me lay the context for our important conversation about security, freedom, and defense. We are now in the 21st century. It appears as though Israel survived the range of assaults its enemies could muster in the 20th century. Technology such as aircraft, massive armies in collaboration, assaulting Israel's homeland, even suicide bombs. Suicide bombs, suicide bombs, with a security fence. So the 21st century presents missile assaults. Missiles are all weather. They're launchable 24 7. Sometimes they're anonymous. When you try to respond, the launchers hit among civilian populations, you're then playing with disproportionate response. The context of our conversation is 21st century missile threats. The second context is American foreign policy. Some might have noticed just a slight shift in American foreign policy. Guantanamo Bay military facility will be closed, yet without an alternate location for dangerous battlefield facilities established. We have a softly, softly foreign policy, which includes an apology to it. The United States is going to join the United Nations Human Rights Council. We attended the preparatory meetings of the Durban to beat up Israel. That's our U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, castigated Israel in her first remarks to the U.N. Security Council for quote, war crimes in Gaza. The nominee to be the State Department's chief legal advisor believes not in the self-rule and self-governance of the people, but in international law and foreign precedent. We have apologized for our treatment of Muslims, even though we rose to their defense and offered treasure and uh, blood around the world in the last 20 years. We bowed to the Saudi king. 
I could lay out more context, and I think we'll probably get to them this evening. The question I have is, what is the response in fear, tiny Israel? What is the response of the West as led by the United States to the range of threats and capabilities, systems, and ideologies of rogue states, failed states, and terror groups? Our program this evening will feature first Avi Shore, who will show his PowerPoint on the theater, the Middle East, and Israel. And then we'll have a conversation with Brian Kennedy of the Claremont Institute for Grand Strategy and the Leadership of the United States and the West. First up, Avi Shore. Born in St. Louis, Avi Shore moved to Israel in 2004. Until his move, he held senior positions at Northrop Grumman's Space Technology Sector, managing the company's Chemical Laser Weapons Initiative, representing the company's capabilities related to critical infrastructure, protection, and work on national homeland security issues. Avi Shore is an expert on space and laser products. He founded and managed the joint U.S. Army and Israeli Ministry of Defense Nautilus and Thel laser programs, making history with dozens of successful shootdowns of Katusha rockets, mortars, and even artillery projectiles at White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico, the tests of our systems. With a Master's in Science from UCLA, Mr. Schur is one of the leading technologists in the world on defense technologies related to next generation warfare. He now undertakes the complicated task of alerting the Israeli public and their U.S. supporters to enemy capabilities and threats and the best paths for Israeli missile defense. He's here tonight in his capacity as the executive director of the Israeli Missile Defense Association. Kindly welcome Avi Shur. Well, first, uh, thank you very much, Larry. Thank you, Brian. I want to thank Doris and the Children of Holocaust Survivors. I think it's a great evening, a very important event. These kinds of grassroots events have very, very, a very, very important role in governance and good government in Israel and the United States around the world. So I certainly salute that important organization. Uh, what I'd like to do this evening is go through fairly quickly some pretty complex material and try to get across a basic sense of what Israel is facing and what are the opportunities to do things about it. Uh, I'll finish with a couple of ideas on how people here can get involved as well. Um, the, uh, I'll try to go fairly quickly because I'd like to leave a significant amount of time for questions. I think I, I'm not I'm much more comfortable in an environment where people can fire questions and just ask and participate. So I think the way we'll do it today is I'll just go through the briefing quickly. Brian has some very important things to say on the strategic perspective of what Israel is facing, what the U.S. is facing, and the linkage. I'll talk about that as well a little bit now, and I think during the question period we can get into that and other issues. So let me, let me get started. Um, what, we're, what we're going to talk about first is the situation that Israel is facing. A reporter happened to be in Sparrow on the first day of school, first day of the school year, with his camera, and this is what he saw. I gave a talk uh, about a week ago, I think some of you may have been present, and when I got to this point, I said something uh, on the fairly personal level, but I think it's important and, and perhaps it would be appropriate to mention it tonight. What you just saw was not, I mean, the danger of showing something like this is people have the sense it's a movie, you know, it's not really real. This is extremely real. I live in Jerusalem, my daughter works in Ofakim. She was home for the Hanukkah vacation 
when the Gaza conflict began and continued. When the vacation was over, she came to me with an unusual question, and one that I did not expect to ever have to face. She said, Dad, they're firing rockets at my school, and I'm a teacher. What do you think? Should I go or stay here? Now, this is not a pleasant question for a father to have to ask, to have to answer. Basically, should I cower in fear or should I go face our enemies? Okay, well, if it were me, I'd have an answer on the tip of my tongue. But for your daughter, it's a little bit harder. It was made more painful for me because I built and tested a very successful weapon that shoots down Katusha's Kassams and short-range rockets, which is not deployed. We'll talk about that a bit more. But I think that's an introduction. We're facing a very real situation, and a situation which grows out of very complex politics. And I'll try to, one of the most important things I think to do this evening is if we can make a little progress in understanding what are the political complexities, that may be something that could be powerful. So let's begin. What is Israel facing? From the very top level, I think what needs to be said is that Israel's enemies have understood there is a fundamental change in the way wars can successfully be fought. What they're doing is they are changing their strategy. They are no longer investing in traditional weapon procurement, in fighter planes, in tanks, and the like. What they're doing is they are intensively procuring missiles, missiles and rockets. And this is something that we have, not seen, we have not seen before on this scale. In fact, the impact of this is very, very important because in modern times, we've occasionally seen rocket attacks, we've occasionally seen missile attacks. But to have a situation where the largest missile fleet in the world is now pointed at Israel is something new. And this change in strategy means that if we're going to survive, we're going to have to find a way to do something democracies basically never do. Before there is a major crisis, we will have to understand what the risks are and change course in a radical way. That's the key. The nature of warfare in the Middle East has changed. And surviving and succeeding and winning will not be the same as it was in the previous wars Israel has fought. It means responding in a way before the crisis hits, before the most severe crisis hits. What it really means in detail is that all of Israel's major population centers are now in range not simply to Iran and not even simply to Syria, but to Hezbollah. Hezbollah now has missiles that can reach all of Israel's cities. And these are not rockets, they're missiles. That means they're not like the Katusha or like the Qassam, which is a terror weapon, it goes wherever it goes, it can't be aimed. Missiles can be aimed with accuracy. We're also talking about very heavy duty missiles. I'll talk about that more in detail. But fundamentally, this is the situation. There is a major change in the nature of warfare. Now, given that change, as we think through how to respond, the critical item here, and I think this really summarizes the entire presentation, there is a gap, what we could call a missile defense gap. There are missile systems that could defend Israel that are under development. There is one system deployed, but there is a massive gap between what exists in Israel and what is available in the world and what is needed. You know, it was, I think, last summer, if people follow missile defense news, what you would have seen is the announcement made by Japan, a very proud announcement. Tokyo is now defended. Tokyo is now surrounded by the best medium-range missile interceptors in the world that exist today. It's called the PAC-3 interceptor. And not only Tokyo, but air bases in Japan, other cities in Japan are systematically being ringed by these defensive systems. They do not exist in Israel.
What I'd like to do now is change course a little bit. That's the basic situation. There are very serious changes in the, the strategy that Israel's enemies are using. Israel's enemies have converted all of their efforts basically now to missile attack. They've seen that that works well. And while Israel has begun a response, Israel is nowhere near filling the gap of what needs to be done. So let's talk now in a little detail first about the threats, and then I'll go next to the defenses, options for defense. First, Iran. Iran has hundreds of missiles. The warheads are nothing like what we see in films of attacks on Gaza or the previous attacks on northern Israel. Those systems have something on the order of 10 to 20 kilogram warheads. We're talking with Iran about warheads in the neighborhood of a ton. One ton of TNT. And that's not exclusively high explosive. They also have chemical warheads, biological warheads, and what's known as the poor man's nuclear warhead, the thermobaric fuel air explosion warhead. These are all obviously extremely dangerous. But the comment in red is probably by far the major danger Israel faces today. Iran, as I think probably everyone in this room knows, is in the process of very successfully developing a nuclear weapon capability. Nuclear weapons can be deployed, can be delivered in two different ways. They can be deployed in, on the ground, a ground attack, or they can be exploded above the atmosphere, what's called an EMP, electromagnetic pulse attack. What almost everyone is familiar with is the sight of a mushroom cloud, a ground attack, a devastating weapon. The irony is that although this weapon is indeed devastating, the impact on any country of a single nuclear weapon on the ground would be horrible, disastrous, but life would go on. It would kill a nuclear attack on a city between 25 and 50,000 people. Obviously, there would be huge destruction if it were in Tel Aviv. God forbid. It would kill tens of thousands of people. It would have a huge financial impact, but life would go on. 98, 99% of the country would survive, and the response to Iran would, of course, be devastating. An EMP attack is interesting, it's different. An EMP attack does not kill anyone immediately. All it would do is destroy all electrical equipment, permanently destroy the capability to deliver electric power, destroy all water delivery, stop cars, stop food deliveries, end communications, telephones, cell phones. It would basically destroy the country. There would be no food delivery, there would be no water available, there would be no sewage, no transportation, no medical services. Israel society, like all modern countries, is based on complex electronic systems. And what an EMP attack does is it destroys those systems. So as bad as the nuclear attack is that has been talked about for some time, what we're seeing now with the capability of using it as a high altitude attack is something much worse than what most people have been talking about. And we can talk about this a little bit more later. I'm sure Brian will touch on it as well. Um, let me go into that just a bit more. Uh, this is not simply a theoretical subject. An Iranian military journal in 2005, quote from the journal, if the world's industrial countries fail to defend themselves against electronic assaults, they will disintegrate within a few years. Another quote from the same journal, soldiers would not be able to find food to eat, nor would they be able to fire a single shot. We're not really just talking about soldiers here, we're talking about everybody. And uh, just that last comment. Iran has completed testing which looks suspiciously like upper atmosphere EMP configuration testing. In other words, they have launched missiles, 
and surprisingly, and very unusually, for some reason, exploded them at high altitude. It's exactly what you would want to do if you were preparing to launch an EMP attack. Before I leave this subject, I'd like to say a few words about what's been going on in the United States addressing this threat. The U.S. established a, uh, U.S. Congress established an EMP commission. You can find it online. Just a couple of quotes from that report. EMP can hold our society at risk of catastrophic consequences. They're not new threats, these EMP effects. But what the report says is that what's different now is that what they call in a very carefully phrased way, some potential sources of EMP threats are difficult to deter. What they're saying is Iran and some of its terrorist allies is not going to be deterrable in the same way the Soviet Union could be deterred. There is good news, and the good news is that with a relatively modest expenditure, this kind of vulnerability can be corrected for the United States, for Israel. Of course, we're talking about Israel tonight, and what's probably most relevant here is that, as has been said many times, Israel in this regard is the canary in the coal mine. When an attack comes, unfortunately, an attack almost certainly will come at some point if we're not ready for it, it will probably come to Israel first. I think it's important to get some visceral sense for what we're talking about, so I included a very short video. But just to provide a sort of a, a more internal idea of what Israel may be facing, than you can get from just understanding and reading the words. What you saw, incidentally, was not really a Syrian or an Iranian silo, but a representative silo. I'll talk about that in a minute, but the fact that these missiles can be launched from silos makes them extremely difficult to hit in attack operations. which is a little bit unusual and a little bit ironic about this threat. Although this is considered to be a fairly high-tech threat, it actually is launched by a very, very ordinary nuclear, low-yield nuclear weapon. And it's even easier to deliver than a ground attack because, as you saw, the missile does not have to re-enter the atmosphere. In fact, in fact the, uh, the missile cannot re-enter the atmosphere for an EMP attack. That makes it much easier to deliver the, the warhead. Is this microphone working? It seems like it's cutting in and out. It's cutting in and out, but it's working. Okay, if we get desperate, I'll just put it down and shout. Okay, so um, just to summarize where we are, what would happen is an EMP strike would occur not actually over Israel's territory, but somewhere over the Mediterranean. It just has to do with the geometry of how an attack would be launched. It would not be obvious that it was happening until suddenly the lights go out, the phones stop working, the electrical power goes off, and does not ever come back on, and uh, water stops flowing, and so forth. Let's, let's, let's go through some of the other threats. Well, first of all, Syria. Now, Syria has tens of thousands of rockets and missiles. This ranges from the Qassam, the Katusha-type rockets, to much more sophisticated missiles, as I said, that can reach anywhere in Israel. And unfortunately, many of Syria's missiles are buried in silos inside mountains. It's not easy to attack a missile that is buried in a silo. Others, of course, are hidden. Hezbollah, similar capabilities to Syria. They have both rockets and medium-range missiles that could hit anywhere in Israel. 
their missiles typically have about half a ton warheads. So imagine a half a ton of TNT going off. Since they can be aimed, that's a very, very serious problem because one would presume the first attack will come probably on Ben Gurion Airport or on one of the air bases. Second attack probably on the Kyria in Tel Aviv. Third attack probably one of the major shopping centers. Then of course there's Hamas. We've all seen what Hamas can do. It's just newspaper stories and ones that seem to frequently be slanted against Israel uh, in other countries, but in Israel it's agony and uh, every injury that occurs is is uh, on the newspapers and the radio and it does not go away. Okay, let's turn to something which I think is is mostly good news. Um, the Arrow missile. Arrow is a long-range missile. It was designed to use against Iran. It is deployed, it is very good, and it is very effective. It is a very good news story, and it is unusual that a country the size of Israel successfully developed and deployed such a missile. Of course, with extensive help from the United States and financial help, although not in technical help. So it's, it's really good news. There is a bad news aspect of the story. The bad news aspect of the story, I don't know if this was quoted in the papers, the production of aero missiles ended this year. It was a co-production program between Israel and the United States, and it is not continuing. What Israel has with these missiles is all it has. This, unfortunately, is Israel's only defense system, meaning whatever they're going to defend against, this is what they've got, and the number of missiles in their magazine is all they're going to have. Just a very, very quick movie. This was the first of many, many successful aero tests. <laughs> Since that time, I think there have been another 16 tests, all of which were successful. It's a very remarkable record. <laughs> Medium range. Now, this would be the range for interceptors of Syria or Hezbollah missiles. <coughs> I, mentioned I mentioned before, there is a missile which is an interceptor which is deployed in Japan. <clears throat> it's called the TAC-3. And this interceptor is very, very effective. There are 500 of these currently deployed in the United States. There are many others deployed with U.S. friends and allies. The U.S. is adding another six to 700 in the coming year or two. It's deployed all around the world, but not in Israel. I'll show you just a minute or so of a recent, <coughs> a recent test. This was actually a very, very stressing test, designed to be more stressing than any real engagement. Uh, incidentally, this missile does not have a warhead on board. It destroys a threat by running into it at a relative speed of about Mach 10. So if you can imagine a car crash at about 10 times the speed of sound, that's how it does its thing. That has a number of advantages. For example, if you're worried about, did I get it? Do I need to send another missile? If you see an explosion in the air, you don't have to worry, well, maybe it was just the warhead going off. There is no warhead. If you see an explosion in the air, then that means you've disintegrated the missile. This is the, uh, <coughs> the high-energy laser weapon that I think was mentioned in the introduction. This is a program that I managed for Northrop Grumman while I was here in the United States. It, uh, what was built was a prototype. The prototype still exists in the desert of White Sands. It was used successfully against a number of, of Katushas that were brought in from Israel operational Katushas. So I'll show you a two-minute movie on this. What you're seeing is pieces. What you're seeing is pieces of the prototype that were put into place in White Sands.
That was the first ever successful destruction of a missile in the air with a high energy laser. So the team was quite excited. The Army has completed the first ever successful test of a system that uses lasers to shoot things down. It's the first time military experts have destroyed a missile in flight using just ground based laser. Since then, the tactical high energy laser has shot down 28 operational Katusha rockets, including single and multiple rocket salvos, and incoming artillery rockets simulating a surprise attack. One of the legacies of that program was the airbase laser. Uh, the airbase laser was a program that was designed to shoot down missiles in boost phase. At the speed of light, you can reach out pretty far. Unfortunately, that was one of the programs that we just heard is going to be canceled by the, uh, by the Pentagon. <coughs> there is a, uh, another system that can be used against very short-range threats like rockets and mortars. It has a number of names. There are actually a few different kinds of systems, but let's just call it the phalanx gun. Uh, that system is not ideal. It has very short range. So you cannot defend a large area with it, or you have to deploy many of them to defend a significant area. But it could be quite helpful in defending a small area, for example, Stero. The US Army uses this system to defend the Green Zone against rockets and mortars. Uh, it, that system is also not deployed in Israel. Uh, there are interceptors in Israel under development, which um, after some years of development and eventually deployment will be extremely important. And that is also very good news. It's very important. I think uh, uh, probably I should provide just a, a quick snapshot of context for this. The United States and Israel both are in a situation where they're facing very, very serious threats, and there is an enormous amount more that could be done, and in my view, should be done. But both are to be congratulated for doing something. The fact that the United States has developed some missile defenses, the fact that Israel is in the process of developing defenses for the future uh, is, is critical and vital. Not enough, unfortunately, but it's a very, very important part of the picture. Okay, so having seen the threats, having seen the defenses, there is something which I'm confident I'll talk about.